Saturday, December 12th, 1959. The man in the cockpit is Major Joseph W. Rogers, 35, resident of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Father of three children, veteran of 170 combat missions in Korea, and holder of 17 decorations. His airplane is an F-106, built in San Diego by the Convair people, and by people in 180 other cities across the nation, who make things like the Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine from Hartford and the Hughes Falcon missile from Culver City, California. Have a look. For if this land were set upon tonight by a force of enemy bombers, this man and his machine and others like him would in that final moment when defender meets attacker be the main rampart between this country and kingdom come. This is how wide the wall, how high the wall, how sharp the land. The aircraft that blew us into World War II in December 1941 approached their target from an altitude of 9,000 feet on a relatively clear day at about 250 miles per hour. It was high enough and fast enough. Nothing stopped them. If there were a manned bomber attack today, it would come at perhaps 60,000 feet and faster than sound. But this time, something would have to stop them. Getting something up there in time is the responsibility of the North American Air Defense Command, headquartered at Colorado Springs, Colorado. There are 200,000 people in NORAD. Army, Navy, Air Force, Canadian and American, civilian and military. NORAD has a defending force of approximately 60 squadrons of combat aircraft, a good percentage of which are stationed on the alert, the clock and the year around at bases in the United States, Canada and Greenland. The man in charge at NORAD is General Lawrence Tudor. This is where General Tudor keeps track of what is going on, on a map of the North American continent about the size of a golf green, where every unidentified airborne aircraft in the entire area covered by the map is plotted within a maximum of five minutes after it is picked up by radar. If the unknowns fail to identify themselves, there is a split-second scramble of Tudor's men to see what's wrong. Easy? No. Any man in uniform will tell you it is the toughest military assignment in the nation. The enemy gets the first move. His equipment is good. He can come in fast, high or low, from north, east or west, good weather or thick. Against these enormous advantages, Tudor must bank on the effectiveness of the radar warning system and on interceptor aircraft that can get off the ground in seconds, climb to 40,000 feet in the time it takes to drive through the Holland Tunnel, find the invader with electronic eyes 10,000 times more efficient than human eyes, and close on him at speeds nearly five times faster than fighter planes of World War II. What are NORAD's chances? It may be that time will tell. For time has become NORAD's element almost as much as air. Warning time and reaction time. The unceasing battle at NORAD is to build one up and cut the other down. A city could be saved with five minutes more warning time. 50,000 lives might be spared if NORAD's defending aircraft could get into firing position in 30 seconds less reaction time. Time is the essence at NORAD. Tudor and his men work with it, for it, and against it, never stopping. On Saturday, December 12th, Major Rogers and his F-106A are working against it, 40,000 feet above the Mojave Desert in California. A clear, cold day, good flying weather. And so Major Rogers is out chipping away at reaction time trying actually to set a new world speed record to improve the official mark of 1,404 miles per hour held by the United States and, if humanly possible, to smash the unofficial record of 1,483 miles per hour 
claimed by Russia. The rules for setting a new world speed record are established by Federation Aeronautique Internationale, a worldwide organization headquartered in Paris and represented in the United States by the National Aeronautic Association. They are not easy rules. In the first place, the old mark has to be bettered by at least 1%. In the second place, the prescribed course is actually an electronic tube 10 miles long, 2 miles wide, and 328 feet deep. Stick a wingtip out of the tube and you're through. It's almost like threading a whole row of needles with one fast sweep of the hand. You don't steer the plane, you aim it. Then, after you've done it once, you have to do it again, going the opposite way, so that your two times can be averaged after the flight to neutralize any favorable winds one way or the other. And just to be sure there are no inaccuracies, the NAA sends a team of 16 men with barographs, motion picture equipment, and stopwatches to supervise. The fight against time in the air is a fight against many things. Q limits, Mach limits, and TT2 limits, for example. The Q limit is how fast an airplane can go without the risk of air pressure crumpling the nose and leading edges of the wings. The TT2 limit is the temperature ceiling for the air feeding into the engine. Let it get too high, and the engines may overspeed or even break up. The Mach limit is the speed beyond which heat and air pressure may cause the aircraft to become uncontrollable. December 12th. This is Major Rogers' seventh attempt. Surely the limits are full in his mind. But so are the rewards. Achieving a few seconds less reaction time. Adding a little to America's deterrent strength. For a new world speed record is the herald of an improved defense capability. A fact any would-be aggressor will remember. And there's also the technical reward. For a flight like this can produce as much technical information about the behavior of aircraft at high speeds as six precious months of normal research. It's worth pushing the limits. This is Roger's approach to the tube. This is his run. But this is not the day either. The plane dropped a few feet beneath the boundary of the skin-tight course and was disqualified. And so the homework starts all over again for both the man and his airplane. There's welcome help from men like Colonel Tom Queen, Air Defense Command Project Officer. Chuck Myers, Convair Chief Test Pilot and Dick Johnson, another Convair test pilot and holder of the world speed record once himself. And there's more watching for a good day. And more waiting. Then on Tuesday, December 15th, another airplane comes in for the try, number 467, a run of the production line 106, which checks in for the occasion at full combat weight of about 34,000 pounds. Earlier, it was given a quick road test by Convair test pilot James Stewart and found to be ready and eager. Weather check again. The day is clear and bright. The weather station reports temperatures at 40,500 feet, Roger's chosen altitude, at minus 65 degrees centigrade, eight degrees colder than the ideal. Up again to the gauntlet of the waiting invisible tube. In his pocket, there's a Tom Sawyer collection of rabbit's feet, good luck pieces, charms, and coins. The offering of his well-wishers before takeoff. 
This is the approach. This is the run. This is the timer's voice counting the miles. We're looking real good in uh, five miles to the first camera station. Three miles. Two miles. One mile. Half. Mark first station. Mark 2.2. Mark 2.3. Five miles, second station. Four. Three. Two. One. Half mile, mark second station. Real fast. Real smooth, guys. It's like stuff. Like a uh, cool man. Cool indeed, Major Rogers. The date, December 15th, 1959. The place, Edwards Air Force Base, California. The pilot, Major Joseph W. Rogers of the Air Defense Command. The plane, a Convair F-106A. The time, 1,525 miles per hour. A new world record, an improvement of 120 miles an hour over the previous official record. Tonight, the moat is a little wider, the wall a little higher, the lance a little sharper.